I, I can speak to that because I think that's what you've described as a thesis that I have long had. And I think, you know, decentralized physical infrastructure networks or this category of, of DPIN is a very fascinating one because ultimately it just speaks to a trend that we've already seen happen in the Web2 ecosystem. So I guess the parts that I can kind of speak to at least are on the, the you know, in, internet infrastructure, namely cloud and telecom side of things. And this entire initiative of like, I think what everybody in the deep in ecosystem believes is there's kind of like a shared vision and the shared vision is like, what's the end state of deep in? And in my mind, the end state of deep in is essentially allowing the end household or end user to provide a meaningful contribution to cloud plus telecom infrastructure, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, compute, storage, bandwidth, right? This is what, you know, the escape philosophy folks are always talking about will be commoditized in the future. The end state that everybody in the deep end ecosystem is pushing towards is one where those resources are actually controlled and provided by the end user in the household. How are you? Good, man. Perhaps we can maybe just start off on a little bit of your background, kind of like your electrical engineering journey at Princeton and uh, get into Adrena and then start talking more about the actual product side. Sure. Sounds good, man. So, you know, my, my background was, uh, you know, always kind of like at the interface between hardware and software. Um, you know, the very first thing I used to do is like build like, you know, model, model rocket controllers for my friends that wanted to like launch fireworks and do a whole bunch of random stuff. Like this was when I was like 14. Um, you know, I started my first business building like custom PCs for people when I was 16. Um, and then in Princeton, you know, I always focused on uh, robotics and, you know, as I said earlier, the intersection between hardware and software. So doing like everything from like low level protocols to, you know, building complicated systems. I was, you know, always participating in hackathons. I was like a, a big, a big thing that I love doing. Um, but, you know, in, in 20, I was class of 2015, but I dropped out in Princeton from 2014 to go work at a healthcare analytics startup. Uh, ultimately, you know, I found that building an expensive SaaS product wasn't necessarily the thing that I wanted to do with my time. Uh, instead of what I wanted to do was work on technology that was a little bit more, you know, I call it meat and potatoes, you know, if that's, who knows if that's a, what it's actually called, but something that was a little bit more relatable to the average household. Um, and so I ended up participating in a project at Facebook to do essentially a close range data sharing uh, d device. So the idea was like a cell phone case that had its own wireless module. So the idea is that if, you know, I was hanging out with you and you had good T-Mobile service and I had bad Verizon service, I could borrow some of your data and compensate you uh, with crypto for that. So I quickly fell in love with this idea of like how people can team up to overcome connectivity shortcomings. And I soon realized that it's, you know, connectivity is obviously a problem that is it faces, you know, all across the world. Uh, but what I wanted to focus on was the way that you can make the biggest impact with connectivity. And in my mind, the answer to that wasn't necessarily on the mobility. It was on this other category of, you know, called fixed services, which is pretty much an Internet connection that doesn't typically move. Um, so, you know, most common fixed services are like home and business internet, right? Verizon, Fios, Xfinity, right? Those are the things that are typically fixed services. Uh, and so what I kind of quickly discovered from that point on is wireless was coming a long way for fixed services. Um, when I looked at like some of the, uh, you know, pioneering work of a company like Rise Broadband, which has built essentially a business providing internet in rural America by just renting spaces on top of big TV broadcasting towers and essentially installing dishes on people's roofs, like up to multiple miles of range. And it was a great connectivity solution. And what I was beginning to notice at that time was that technology that was pioneered in rural America was beginning to make its way towards the urban settings and become more and more cost effective. Ever since like 802.11 AC technology, now up to millimeter wave, the technology has come a long way in terms of like raw performance and also mainly in terms of cost. So I guess the kind of, you know, end to my, my story here is I ended up realizing that if you could team up with people that have excess connectivity and people that have good real estate coverage, you can essentially find a way to take excess capacity and bring it to people that have bad solutions for capacity. So we ended up teaming up with my former university to actually build a wireless ring across their campus and then start bridging that off to the surrounding area. And, you know, that's exactly what we did. And that was kind of the start of our, our Web2 business, right? We knew that there was a, a blockchain piece in the works of it. The timing wasn't right. And we can kind of get to like what made me realize that the timing was right now. 
Um, but we essentially ended up building off a wireless ring off of the campus and then broadcasting that to the surrounding area and then focused on building a user experience inside multifamily buildings that would allow us to scale that network. And so since then, we've scaled a wireless network from you know, Princeton, New Jersey as our first market to now 10 different states. And you know, we're providing internet, uh, internet coverage to around 10,000 households, so 10,000 active users on the system. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of like this interesting thing of, you know, I had a cool background working on some electronics and robotics and I was able to kind of fall in love with the networking and wireless side of stuff. And, you know, now as we look at, you know, the future for what Dawn is, and we'll get into that shortly, uh, the, I think it kind of jives quite nicely. And we have a really cool vision for, I think, how we can bring wireless connectivity to everybody as a means to really disinter disintermediate the central providers. Um, so hopefully that's a kind of like a good quick overview about my background. No, it's an amazing. I, I appreciate the in-depth answer. I think for me, it's just damn impressive of what you guys have built thus far. I mean, nearing, or you said uh, around 10,000 houses already connected, uh, having uh, internet connections that are generally much cheaper than the alternatives would be. And to me, w one of the reasons why I got so excited about more holistically, this category of decentralized physical infrastructure networks was that if you remove crypto, it still works. It, like it may be a little bit harder to coordinate. It may be more friction within that, but there is a product at the end of the day that's providing very clear value and crypto essentially the coordination tool that allows everybody to really come together, allow that network to move quicker uh, and the coordination tool behind it. And I think it's been interesting to me just seeing some of these decentralized physical infrastructure projects more broadly, kind of like almost reject um, some of the coordination tools uh, or just realize that potentially crypto may have that uh, extra sauce that they needed to scale um, to larger communities and more broadly. Yeah, and I, I can speak to that because I think that's what you've described as a thesis that I have long had. And I think, you know, decentralized physical infrastructure networks or this category of, of DPIN is a very fascinating one because ultimately it just speaks to a trend that we've already seen happen in the Web2 ecosystem. So I guess the parts that I can kind of speak to at least are on the, the you know, in, internet infrastructure, namely cloud and telecom side of things. And this entire initiative of like, I think what everybody in the deep in ecosystem believes is there's kind of like a shared vision and the shared vision is like, what's the end state of deep in? And in my mind, the end state of deep in is essentially allowing the end household or end user to provide a meaningful contribution to cloud plus telecom infrastructure. Right. Whether it's, uh, you know, compute, storage, bandwidth. Right. This is what, you know, the escape philosophy folks are always talking about will be commoditized in the future. The end state that everybody in the deep end ecosystem is pushing towards is one where those resources are actually controlled and provided by the end user in the household. And you've seen that entire transition, which has already existed in the Web2 space happen one way or another like the best example is like if you look at like you know like in in in, in uh you know rakuten for example and as like a as a mobile carrier is looking at doing like um you know miniature data centers at their tower sites or whether it's you know looking at the initial vision of filecoin for example right it's just kind of moving these resources more towards the edge because it's just cheaper to have the resources at the edge. There is this inevitability that from a cost perspective that these resources are going to go from consolidated footprints to more disaggregated footprints. And the kind of main reason why I can point to is like if you look at like the cost per square footage of buying a data center versus like a multifamily apartment building, like the cost per square foot for a data center is like $180 per square feet, but a multifamily apartment building is like $1 to $3 per square foot. So physically hosting this infrastructure that powers the internet as we know it, it's inevitable that it's going to go from a more expensive footprint to a cheaper footprint. So to your point, Logan, about all of this is like, it's a trend that we all kind of agree on what the same vision is, how we get there. There might be a couple of disagreements on that, but we all see how it's inevitable and why it's inevitable. And I think the part that really 
exemplifies how to really accelerate this entire trend, but also to solve a lot of different problems that come from disaggregation is ultimately the blockchain piece of it uh, to really form a trustless layer on it. So I couldn't be more aligned from you uh, for, uh, with you on uh, a core vision here. And, you know, I hope everybody that's listening that kind of like, you know, starts to think and ask, like, what is this deep in space and what does it look like? Keep that end vision in mind about this is a way in which the cloud plus telecom, right? The internet as we know it can be owned and controlled by the end users and they can provide their excess surplus to a whole greater ecosystem. So hopefully that's uh, helpful for you guys. Yeah, 100%. Maybe to start off the conversation, I, I think it would be helpful to maybe talk a little bit about the product side first and talk about how Adrena and Don are able to really provide kind of internet at a cheaper rate than I would say the historical providers, where that kind of arbitrage lies within the data center, how you guys are doing the last mile, and then transition from what is actually delivered from the product side to the end, to product side to the end consumer to more of the technical aspects and how that ultimately all comes together. Because I really want people to understand the holistic product vision of what you guys are trying to achieve in the technology that you've built in-house combined with kind of that crypto coordination um, tools. Yeah. So let me actually just give like a quick overview on both sides of, of, of the thing of the you know business so that folks can kind of really understand what each piece is. So, you know, I'm the CEO of Andrina. So Andrina is like a, a, an upstart disruptor wireless and fiber internet service provider. So we essentially go to data centers, we buy a bunch of capacity, and then we work with property owners to bring connectivity to their residents. That's kind of like our core Web2 business that we've been doing for a while now. Um, that's one that we've got to the 10,000 households across 10 states. The Web3 side of stuff is this protocol that we've created called DAWN, which essentially stands for Decentralized Autonomous Wireless Networks. And DAWN is a protocol that uses some of the IP that we have built at Andrina to allow anybody to grow the network with us. The underlying vision of it is essentially to create a protocol for providing decentralized broadband. So rather than working with somebody like an Andrina, you can actually get it from anybody that has excess bandwidth to share in their surrounding area. And the easiest mental model I can give to folks is think about it from the perspective of what Helium has done to mobile service, right? Helium provides decentralized mobile service. What Dawn will do is provide decentralized fixed service. So internet for your home or for your business. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of fun things that we can kind of get into that. But ultimately, that's the future that we believe in is that you don't need to buy internet service from a centralized provider like Verizon or Comcast, you can seamlessly buy it from your community that has excess capacity to hand out to folks. So that is kind of the overview about, you know, what Andrina is and then Don, but, you know, Logan, you got a question? Can you speak to specifically like kind of what you have, the arbitrage with going to the data centers, getting the backhaul, how that's structurally cheaper, and then also talk about on the Don side, um, how you can just essentially share your internet access or access capacities with others around you. Because that yeah, arbitrage, so I think a lot of people don't really understand. And it's something that I really want the listeners to get uh, have more knowledge around. Yeah, so in, integral to both sides on the Web 2 and Web 3 side is what Logan's pointing out here, which is the idea of like you buy internet at one location that is very cheap and you find a way to move it to another location that is historically been more expensive. So well, the way that that looks is at a data center side is where internet has, is historically incredibly cheap. So, you know, there's a bunch of people, if you think about like the internet supply chain, the way that I kind of think about it is there's three different tiers, tier one, tier two, and tier three. The tier three internet providers are like Comcast and Verizon, right? The guys that we buy internet service from. The tier ones are like, think like subsea fiber optic cables, people that just interconnect continents and provide that connectivity. And then on the tier two side, this is where essentially this arbitrage opportunity happens. It's the guys who make a business model out of essentially interconnecting data centers. And there's a whole couple of different categories from internet exchanges to wholesale IP transit providers. But the main thing for the viewers to know is that tier two internet providers, you can buy a whole bunch of data for incredibly cheap. Like the easiest way to kind of give that comparison is your home internet bill. Like at my home, I pay 120 bucks for my Verizon gigabit connection. At a data center side, you can buy that capacity for as low as 40 or 50 cents. Like that's really where the magic happens and this whole price, 
this price spread is why internet providers exist in the first place, is that wholesale tier two internet transit is just so damn cheap. And you just need to find a cost-effective way to take it from point A to point B. And the reason why they're so expensive, at least on the fiber side, like why am I paying under twenty dollars? It because it, it costs thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars, to run fiber from that data center towards my my apartment. Right? That is where why you need to have that price spread be so much, so that you know these internet providers can recoup their investment on their capex spend. Uh, where we and how Andrina has fit into this is our approach was. What if we could beam internet from the rooftop of a data center towards a surrounding apartment building? And then I can avoid the entire massive cost of running fiber down the streets. It's just this one time, very cheap expense, less than a thousand dollars for a wireless link that can do multi gigabit capacity. That's really where things begin to get unlocked. And so what everything hinges on, I guess, on the Andrina side and on the Dawn side is that effective arbitrage is being able to leverage places where internet is incredibly cheap and as we think towards the protocol, providing a user incentivized way where people can own that own infrastructure and contribute a little bit to take it from point A to point B so that people can get those entire economics. Like the dream of what I have for all of this is like, how do we bring those wholesale Internet prices towards the retail environment? Like I want a world where people aren't paying one hundred twenty dollars for a gig of the Internet. They're paying ten or twenty dollars for a gig of the Internet. And in a user powered system like this, thanks to wireless being so cheap is what really allows something like this to happen. So that arbitrage is kind of the nuance of how something like this is even possible. Yeah, when I started to dive into this and understand just exactly how cheap the data center internet really was and the technology that really you guys have enabled uh, combined when you can kind of throw some crypto magic for the coordination, there's really something special there. And I think people really do not understand how expensive that last mile really is to hook up the data center to either residential or houses, apartments. It's fairly expensive. And I think like maybe the crude but directionally correct analogy here is going from like dial-up internet to, um, or not dial-up internet, but more kind of like landline phones to wireless service. Uh, and the kind of emerging nations are just able to leapfrog what we've previously had in the United States with no lines and go directly uh, to wireless cell phone plans. And I think here, whether it's emerging or um, kind of residential, the opportunity is also within that spread. Um, you can be able to enable cheaper internet more broadly for um, millions, hundreds of millions of people. Yeah, and and that's the the if you look at sort of like what are the really successful models in wireless that have you know created this trend, it essentially flips the way that the capex model is structured. So like to to Logan's point here, like when he's talking about like why the last mile is so expensive, for anybody that wants to kind of like understand the bread and butter of TMT or telecom analysis here is there's two real metrics to understand. It's like, what's the cost to pass a home? So imagine like running fiber down your street and what's the cost to activate your home? And that's just like physically taking that connection from the street and plugging it into your home. The traditional models that we know of the internet are very high on the cost to pass a home. So in order to create a lot of coverage, it's very expensive, but the cost to activate the home is much lower on the order of a little bit less than a thousand dollars, probably a couple hundred bucks. The most successful wireless models that we have seen that have taken us from this sort of like cable infrastructure to wireless infrastructure have inverted that capital model. And so a good example of that is, you know, 4G LTE and, you know, now 5G. And we can you know talk about a whole bunch of stuff on 5G. But the point being is they have found that you can actually spend a little bit, a little bit good chunk of money on a centralized transmitter that gives you, in terms of households past, a huge bunch of coverage. And then on the flip side, it might be a little bit more expensive to activate the home, but you really get to create a lot of momentum by creating a wireless coverage. And that, in my mind, is what the promise of wireless can achieve is just flipping that capital model to allow businesses to scale much faster. Because once you get that coverage, 
that is really when when these sorts of initiatives can really take off the ground. And one really good and classical example of this is something like Starlink, right? Like if you look at the raw coverage of Starlink, like for them, I got to double check the exact numbers, but we're talking like tens of dollars to pass a home, even though it costs billions to put that constellation in space, right? The underlying cost is spread out over so many different households. And that is really the magic of wireless here is, is you take that cost structure that is typically known and you completely flip it on its head such that the cost of creating coverage is so low, but then the cost of actually activating a user once you each actually have that revenue is a little bit higher, but that's okay because you know the revenue is going to be coming in. And that is just a more efficient way of doing telecom, right? Is your, your customer acquisition cost is just lower from a, a, a from the upfront side of stuff. And then you actually have more confidence in being able to service people. So there's a lot of fun things that we can chat about that, but that in my mind is like the two most successful wireless models, right? Mobility and now something like LEO and Starlink. And they have demonstrated unit economics like that that make wireless successful. And as we look at what Dawn is capable of doing, it's, it's very similar in that sort of model where people are owning their own base stations and creating a lot of coverage. Like we're talking like coverage for 10 to $15 per household. Uh, and then it's, also very cheap for somebody else on the downstream to get set up. So I'd say those, those are, you know, not to repeat myself too much, but those are the successful wireless models that I really like. No, I, I think it should be re repeated because I think this is not fairly widely understood about how um, disruptive this can be. And I think it warrants kind of double clicking on really how massive this arbitrage is. And it wasn't until recently that the technology was really just became possible to do this. But before jumping maybe into some of the more technical nuance, can you dive out slightly deeper into the Dawn side as well uh, and how that's ultimately can be used um, at kind of like the home internet sharing perspective and maybe even dive into for what you can share on the hardware side. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover all of that. So to give you guys a sense on the Dawn piece. So as I kind of started off, right, Dawn is a protocol for providing decentralized broadband. And the best mental model that, if, you know, if you're a listener that I want to kind of keep with you here is think about Dawn very similar to what solar panels did to electricity, right? We see a model to do the same thing with Dawn, except for internet. And the way that essentially solar, you know, kind of democratized, I guess, access to power where anybody can just get their own power. It's very similar with Dawn. Uh, the same way that in the case of solar, you own your own infrastructure. You don't have to depend on any carrier to generate your own power, but then it gives you access to a very cheap resource and you can even sell your excess capacity back to the grid. Right. This is a functionally very similar from the Dawn perspective where users own their own node. They'll get access to a very cheap resource and whatever they don't use, they can sell that back to the surrounding grid. The nature and why the blockchain is even necessary in this sort of scenario is like unlike in the case of solar, you don't need to collaborate. Right. I can just put up solar panels and I can just grab power for my own use. But in the case of wireless coverage, a single wireless link, you know, in the best case scenario, maybe less than five miles worth of range, you need to kind of create these hops of wireless connections to create a mesh in a given area. And that problem of that is that it, that inherently relies on collaboration. And so what the blockchain piece does is that allows us to actually add a trustless layer where I don't need to trust somebody else on what resources that they have to know the underlying state of the network. And so the biggest kind of first piece of the technology here is the same way blockchains, you know, people talk about network consensus, they achieve network consensus. The way that we use them is to build wireless network consensus. So essentially to achieve that, there's three major proofs that we have here. We have proof of backhaul, which essentially is like, you can think of it like a decentralized speed test. It allows us to know in a trustless way, what is the capacity and what is the amount of supply a node has. Number two is proof of location. So we actually know where an individual node is and, you know, where telecom resources are is an important metric, right? I can't be, you know, we can't be giving people wireless devices to connect to if nodes are way too far away. And then the third piece of this is actually proof of frequency is in, in any large scale wireless network, there's only a, there's a limited amount of spectrum. And the FCC and the rest of the world is releasing a lot of spectrum right now, thanks to six gigahertz. So there's a huge opportunity for us to be able to leverage that. 
But the point being is you need a communication layer that really allows to, and make sure that people don't step on each other's toes. It's the same way that the FCC goes out an auction spectrum to Verizon, like in 3.7 gigahertz or in T-Mobile to 2.5 gigahertz. You need some level of a coordination layer that holds people honest to use the frequencies that are actually allocated towards them. So those are really kind of the core pieces of it from the blockchain side of stuff, right? We need to find a way to develop wireless network consensus. And then we need to have a way in which we can hold people accountable towards all of that so that people can operate in a trustless fashion. So that's kind of the, a good quick primer on, on sort of how all that fits in together. Do we want to touch upon like the spectrum space and like what hardware you guys kind of enabled from as like the next jumping off point? Yeah, let's get let's get right into that. So from the spectrum piece to understand here is every time there is a new allocation of spectrum for operators to build cool networks with and you know vendors to build new technology, it leads to like a huge you know economic transition, right? And the most famous one that we're all familiar with is probably the the public release of 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, which essentially leads to led to the creation of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Like think about how many you know, ecosystems were built because of the creation of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And the latest one, or I guess the second latest one that was really of note here was on CBRS, which was 3.5 gigahertz. And CBRS was essentially how a company like Helium built their entire network. They said, great, we have the spectrum available to build a very cool wireless product for mobility applications. So now we can take this and go apply this to this area. The part that we are leveraging now is this category of uh, uh, for fix, fixed wireless, which is you know two major categories here. It's the millimeter wave and microwave. The millimeter wave, think like very short wavelengths, uh, very high on the frequency, so 60 to 80 gigahertz. And that stuff started really becoming mainstream in 2019 up to 2023. And then that final piece of this is on the microwave side, which is six gigahertz. So the FCC, essentially th to Wi-Fi 6E is the whole category. They released 1.2 gigahertz of six gig spectrum. So I believe like 5.9 to 7.1 gigahertz. And the rest of the world has followed suit. You know, they split it up in different ways, but this is kind of the next frontier, right? Is we now have a whole chunk of spectrum, even more than what was released when Wi-Fi was created. So now that we have all this new spectrum to do a bunch of cool connectivity applications on, we've been keeping our eyes peeled for like, what are vendors building on here? And the category which really enables both Andrina and Dawn is this category of wireless called point to multipoint fixed wireless and point to multipoint fixed wireless that also happens to be multi gigabit. So what that means is you essentially have one node that can talk to many other nodes and provide multi gigabit fashion. That technology first started hitting the market mainstream 2022, 2023 for 60 gigahertz and beyond uh, 60 to 80 gigahertz. Uh, but six gigahertz just started getting released vendors, you know, like Tirana and Cambium just started getting approved less than two months ago. So we're in a scenario that, you know, in my mind is going to be a golden age for wireless and terrestrial applications because we finally have that major threshold of point to multi point and multi gigabit. And those are really the two things that you need to be able to actually replace the existing solutions that are fiber that are out there. Because historically, we've had point to point solutions. So two radios kind of pointed at each other that could do multi gigabit. That stuff ended up being very expensive, but it's also not scalable, right? If you need to put up a new antenna for every single customer, it doesn't really scale that well. But the fact that we have sort of this gold standard of gigabit functionality with one node can talk to many, that is really the major unlock that we have and we as an industry have to take advantage of here. And what we have done on the Andrina side to go on top of that is, you know, one of our core pieces of IP is we built something that we call the ROS, which is stands for the robotic antenna system. And the way that you can think about it is essentially like a downstream antenna from a, a centralized transmitter that can actually aim and align itself. Like one of the trickiest parts of deploying your own fixed wireless gear is going through the process of aiming and optimization, right? Sometimes you have to deal with reflection. Sometimes you have to deal with interference. There's a lot of different things. And our thesis was, could we build something for both our own operations, but also now usable for everybody else that allows that to seamlessly and automatedly uh, align itself to be able to be both, you know, good for initial setup, but something that also allows it to heal, right? So if you deploy one of these nodes, you can point at one signal source, but if a better connection opportunity springs up from the community, it can now point itself to a completely different signal source. 
And that, in my mind, is really the power of this Raz solution is it helps add the A in Dawn, right? Decentralized autonomous wireless networks. It helps make it autonomous. And that is a, a really core piece of it. It's and, kind of you know, like I, what SpaceX is doing with Startlink, isn't it? Exactly. Very similar, right. uh, technologies. Exactly. And that was, you know, I, I can't say that was an inspiration. They, we were working on this technology before, uh, you know, before they went to market for it. But you they beat, beat us to market. Yeah, they, but they beat us to market for it. So they get a lot of credit for that, obviously. But yeah, in the case of like a Starlink type installation, you install a dish on top of your roof. And there's actually a slew drive mechanism in there that actually points it at the constellation. And then they have their own phased array, which does even tighter beam forming. But the point being is like this technology is necessary because directionality in wireless is one of the major things that we need to leverage that multi gigabit functionality. We can't just have omnidirectional antennas that don't form a beam. They need to direct the beams in very tight paths. And that is really where a mechatronic type system comes into play. In the long run over the future, there would probably be like what's called uh, elect electrical beam steering, which essentially uses a very complicated patch antenna to beam that signal without any moving parts. But the industry is not there yet. It's too expensive to implement those types of solutions. So what we've opted for is essentially is a robotic antenna system. Uh, so that is, a, I think, a very cool system that you know we haven't seen out there in the market uh, you've seen them in the case of satellite, for example, but in this case of terrestrial, we haven't seen anything like that. And again, it's what allows this network to be entirely autonomous so that an end user doesn't have to be a wireless expert to be able to help set up an individual node. And that's a key piece for this is, is to, to be able to be simple for the user, but also allow it to heal and readjust itself on the fly. Yeah, I, I hope all the listeners are really kind of like dialed in because it's really, as you've kind of been pointing out through all this, whether on the technical side from uh, the technology with the multi-beam uh, at gigabit speeds, uh, being able to have the relationships uh, with the data centers by the backhaul, create these proof of observes, uh, the coordination tools on the blockchain side, and even from the blockchain architecture design, those just now hitting levels of scale that can actually support a system like this that's cost and efficient to help on the coordination side. Really, all the pieces are coming together where ultimately what it is unlocking is this arbitrage between the data center that is really extremely cheap internet access and really cutting out the last mile that historically was the most expensive um, and making it essentially more widely available through especially some of these hardware technologies that you guys have also helped build. Can you talk a little bit more just about the hardware, both from like the multi-beam and kind of the residential um, kind of customer facing side or and how those kind of intertwine with the network as well? Yeah, so there's three major pieces of what we have built at Andrina that is IP that is now going to be relevant inside Dawn. The first one is that robotic antenna system. So as a refresher, it's an antenna that can point and aim itself to whatever the signal source is. So the idea is that you can have an automated deployment and then a self-healing network. The second piece of it is we actually went down the route of building our own Wi-Fi system. So whenever you bring connection to a building, the most cost effective way to propagate that connection throughout a building, whether it's a commercial building, a multifamily building, is using you know, the latest of Wi-Fi technology, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and now Wi-Fi 7. So we've manufactured our own PCBs with custom antennas to be well suited for that environment. So the idea of somebody who's like, say, running like a four unit Airbnb, they get a Dawn connection to their building and they can actually use this really cheap Wi-Fi system. We're talking, you know, less than way less than $100 per, per device. But then the idea is it creates what's called an FDD mesh throughout the entire building. So it's a frequency frequency division based mesh throughout the entire building. So you essentially have really good frequency reuse so that you can essentially have high speeds throughout the entire area. That was one where we've seen a big lift from working with our landlord partners. It provides better performance. It's cheaper for us. And now you can actually provide those types of solutions in your own unit, your own apartment building, whatever it is. The point being is like the last couple hundred feet is really where something like this comes into play. It allows you to get your Dawn backhaul connection and then propagate it throughout your building, throughout your apartment very cost effectively and also share that with other people in the surrounding area. So that entire system is one that le really leverages to that. And again, it, it just gives you good coverage for yourself, but it allows you to share that with anybody in your vicinity. That's the second piece of it. 
The third core piece of this one is, is one of is one that's very special to me. Um, and it's one that I think aligns and resonates quite nicely with that deep in vision that we were speaking to earlier. So what we have built, and I'll you know, give the quick overview before I get into the pretense of it, what we've built is essentially a software router. So the underlying thesis and vision behind it is I always say like, what if every single Verizon or Comcast router slash modem was replaced by a high performance server, right? Your router that sits in your home to provide your internet connection is just providing, uh, you know, it's just doing internet, but it is an active piece of electronics that has a lot of potential. And so in my mind, if that was replaced by a high performance server, now you have taken a massive step towards achieving this decentralized vision where the actual household is participating in the overall cloud. And so thanks to some technology that was re released by Cisco, namely VPP, it's called Vector Packet Processing, it allows you to essentially do and create a software-based router on a generic purpose computer. And that is really the special thing here. So we've built our own software router that operates this entire network that sits on a generic purpose computer. And the idea behind it is, again, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is not only is your router going to be giving you a cheaper source of Internet through Dawn, but it's going to be able to participate in any decentralized deep end project that's out there that actually participates in helping cloud infrastructure. So whether it's something like IONet or Akash and you want to do something on the GPU side, whether you want to do something on the storage side with Filecoin, now your individual household can participate in this greater ecosystem. And so our vision for all of this is we want cheap internet to essentially be, you know, a little tongue in cheek, kind of like a Trojan horse for getting this high powered infrastructure into people's households. So that allows you to actually participate in this greater ecosystem. And one of the kind of like key things for all of Deepin is like, what is that killer app? What is that killer use case that helps bring this entire Web3 ecosystem and expand it to everybody? And our belief is cheap Internet is going to be that case, right? What is more relatable than, than a cheaper source of Internet, right? Everybody in the world uses it. So if you can find a way to use that cheap Internet to then bring an additional platform where the entire cloud now becomes a part of everyone's home, then you've taken a massive step forward towards this entire deep in vision. And so... I'm, I'm really excited for that by that entire thing that we're building. And the software router is one piece where we kind of say, hey, if we can kind of do two birds with one stone in the form of a software router, let's do it. Because now there is going to be so much more equity value in the individual household now that it's participating in the entire cloud infrastructure itself. I love it. It's a uh, it's beautiful vision. And I, I think as we've kind of alluded to throughout this podcast, it's it's one that's only recently kind of become possible and the stars are kind of aligning at this day and age where you really are going to be the first mover. And to your point where the industry historically from these deep end projects has been constrained, not by the supply side, because generally um, the incentives are there to bring the supply side on it's by the demand side, but if internet access um, is something that I think the entire world needs, uh, saying, going to people and saying, hey, I can lower your annual, your monthly internet bill by a pretty significant margin and it's not going to really impact uh, your internet speeds. If anything, it may make them quicker for most people. Uh, that's a pretty compelling pitch. Uh, you're not really constrained by the demand side because the demand is already there. And, and that's kind of my, my ask to everybody in the deep end ecosystem is like, we all agree on what this end state is, where, where the average household is participating in both cloud and telecom. The real question and to piggyback off of what Logan is saying is like, what is that key demand driver that is going to accelerate that trend to the next level? And I think in my mind, people tend to talk a little bit too much about tokens and less about the underlying value that the consumer is going to be getting. And I think our focus as Dawn is we are very focused on the underlying utility the consumer is going to be getting. And the utility that they're going to be getting is going to be cheaper, better internet that they can then bring and share that to their entire community. And that, in my mind, is one of the most compelling demand drivers that we have in DPIN today. I'm, I'm fully, fully aligned with that vision. And I, I think it's one that we can all steadily march towards together. So I, I appreciate you and the team uh, pushing forward on that front. Can you talk a little bit? I, I think there's some wind of possibly a 
kind of browser extension as well that the team is working on. Can you kind of work through, walk us through the mechanics of that and the vision there? Yeah, so th this is one that I'm, I'm excited to talk to everybody about. Uh, what we wanted to build is something that allows everybody in the world to help get started with our network. So we've got a couple of announcements that are going to be coming out in the, in the coming weeks here and, you know, everything from fundraising to a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but the point being here is in the blockchain piece of it, one of the things I mentioned is this concept of proof of backhaul where you need to make sure that individual nodes are honest about the speeds that they're providing. That enables a whole bunch of things like decentralized SLAs so people can get reimbursed automatically when they're not getting the speeds that they were promised. But key to that is the proof of backhaul system. And the proof of backhaul system essentially has the prover, somebody that needs to validate their underlying speed, and then the challenger ecosystem. And when you think of challengers, you can just think about validators. They help us build and validate network consensus. And so what we are engineering right now is actually a Chrome extension that anybody can download and use a little bit of their bandwidth that they have in their household to challenge people in the network and make sure that they're holding people honest. So, I mean, it's going to be one way in which people can get involved early on. It's going to be as simple as downloading a Chrome extension and get going. But the underlying point here is you can help keep people honest in the ecosystem and use your excess bandwidth as a source for challenging people inside that ecosystem to make sure that they have the supply that they say that they have. Uh, so I, I think these sorts of ways by which the entire community can help participate in a very small way, this Chrome extension is, a, is an excellent approach towards that, in my opinion. And I think you guys are going to have fun with it for sure. Yeah, I, I think that is a tricky part, uh, but it, it's good to get people involved. And I think it also really kind of comes back to what crypto is good at is coordinating humans to do something and kind of incentivizing them in some form or fashion. And I, I think it, that just kind of speaks volumes to the Chrome extension, but also the medallion system as well. Can you talk about that on like a high level? Because I think the medallion system is interesting because today you are alive in nine or 10 states, but you want to be really global, um, it, not just the US, uh, hopefully internationally uh, across the entire United States. On a high level, can you talk about some of your thoughts around the medallion system and how you're going to use that to kind of help scale the ecosystem? Yeah. So for all of the readers that might have never heard of the medallion system, um, Sal from Escape Velocity, uh, we worked with him as well as Jason from Daylight to essentially brainstorm this new mechanism that we think is going to be a gold standard across deep in projects. Uh, the underlying problem that really where the medallion came into it is we knew that when it comes to providing you know, coverage rewards in a given network, some areas are gonna be more valuable than others, right? Like as part of the Dawn ecosystem, we know that node operators should be rewarded more in areas like New York City versus somewhere where that doesn't have a lot of density because we don't want to we don't want the protocol to essentially focus on the less dense areas. We want them to focus on the more dense areas. And so then we're thinking like, what's the right way to go about doing this? Like, how do we go about doing this from a governance perspective? Are we just going to, you know, put our fingers to the wind and guess what the multiplier should be in a given area? Um, and so ultimately what we wanted to opt for was actually to a way to use market forces to help drive that. So the idea behind a medallion is a medallion can actually is, is converted from a set of staked of, of stake. So you essentially stake to get a medallion and then you as the medallion holder will be able to delegate that medallion to a given region. And when you delegate that medallion to a given region, it actually increases the reward multiplier for a given area. So you as somebody who's like a medallion lawyer says, oh, I think New York is going to be a great opportunity for growth for the Dawn ecosystem. Let me go stake my tokens to go put them towards a medallion that can then actually increase and accelerate and further incentivize people in an individual area. And you as a medallion holder will get some level of economic rights towards the growth that happens in that entire area. So, you know, I, I highly encourage you guys to all check out Sal's piece on this. That will give you a little bit more detail and we'll, of course, be coming out with more ways about to describe how the medallion system works with Dawn and how you can get involved. But really, it's a flywheel mechanism between people that want to stake and people that want to deploy and finding a way to essentially match them where the stakers are delegating it towards markets. And that increases the rewards in a given area. And then that incentivizes operators to go deploy as part of this community. It's this kind of way in which you can really create this 
interesting mechanism between people that have belief about what will grow and an entire community. And it operates purely at the protocol level without any governance. And so that's what I think is really cool about this is it's a way to find a way where to build without having to have any central authority, any foundation participate in this entire process. It is purely community driven. And that I think is what's, what's the beauty of it. We, we love uh, flywheels at Frictionless Capital. When we we're kind of going through our naming for the fund, we were thinking about what to call us and flywheel was one of those. And so I, I love the, me the mechanisms to uh, make that happen uh, because ultimately I think it's already extremely impressive just how many houses are actually using the services today. And I think you guys will really surprise people over the next coming months as people really start to grasp their head around what you have already built and how it's really only the beginning. And I think that's what I really want to impress here on the listeners is that this technology is just now aligning. Uh, Neil has been working on this for <laughs> since the early days from his time at Princeton. And it's really something that I think everybody needs in their day-to-day -day lives, which is internet access that's fast and cheap. Um, and then once you can build upon that, as Neil has kind of talked about, uh, kind of being the home for the deep end, there's a lot of interesting avenues. And so uh, to me, what you have built, uh, Neil, with Adrena and Don is really at the precipice of what this industry should be doing, which is pushing really novel applications that just use blockchain as the coordination tool on the back end, which is the reason why it gets me so excited. Yeah, well, well said. And, and I think, you know, what we want everybody to kind of believe in is like, I personally first got deep down this route because I just did not enjoy the entire experience of buying a home internet connection, having only one provider. Like the latest stats are like 52% of Americans only have one internet provider to choose from. Like what I really want to build is a system that frees us all from that entire thought process, right? How could we find a way to add a level of trust a level of supply, and then pair that with what we know and have demonstrated there is demand for. So, I mean, again, I just want to find a way to democratize the internet one way or another, and this is the best approach that I could find for it, right? In a scenario where fixed wireless is getting to the functionality where we need from a multi-gigabit fashion, to Logan's point, now what we need is a coordination layer. And for those of you that you know find fascination in sort of these community-powered networks, like, look at the history from how wireless first got started with mesh network from like RoofNet and MIT, which demonstrated, you know, a 900 megahertz mesh to now initiatives like GwiffyNet of 40,000 nodes in Catalonia, Spain and beyond. That is essentially just a bunch of people that are pointing wireless dishes at each other and doing that. If you can take that entire concept where people have demonstrated and take that to the next level, that's the future that we're trying to build. And you can see why so many people find that compelling. It's just People hate having to, to deal with a, you know, a centralized provider like this. And if you can find a way where people own their own infrastructure, that's very much so the future we want, we believe in. And if we can find a way in which that then piggybacks and adds and becomes that Trojan horse for a greater deep envision, it's not hard to imagine a future world where the cloud and the internet is all around us and nobody really owns it. And that is, I think, is, is the, the, the dream that everybody in Deepin believes in, is what is it like to build an internet that nobody owns? We all own a piece of it. It's a beautiful vision. Maybe as we're wrapping up here, Neil, where can people ultimately learn more about Adrena, about Don, if they want to learn about signing up for the services, uh, getting involved on the hardware side, where can you point people? So the easiest way for now is, is come check out, you know, I hate saying this, but come check out my Twitter because that's probably where I'm going to be posting a lot of these updates. It's at Neil C underscore Dawn. Uh, and we're going to be releasing a website, a bunch of interesting announcements of what we're doing, but that's kind of the easiest way to just see the latest updates. Um, sorry to drop that guys. I, you know, obviously don't feel great about doing that, but it's, it is going to be the easiest I'll put way it to in get the show there. notes. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, man. Cool. No worries. Um, awesome. Well, truly, Neil, uh, thank you for coming on. I've been looking forward to this uh, and talking with entrepreneurs that I think are really building for the long term and building products that actually help people at scale. And I think why I'm generally very excited about this is because everybody needs fast internet. Everybody wants it cheaper and they um, 
have finally, we now finally have the tools to enable that. And so I think the stars are aligning uh, and I appreciate you kind of being at the helm to carry the torch and make this network possible. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Logan, and everybody. You know, thanks for your attention and listening to all of this. If you guys have any questions about anything I discussed, you know, feel free to hit me up, and we can always riff on this. It's always a fascinating space for me to talk about. So, thank you again for the time, man. I appreciate it.